Good afternoon and welcome to the second of this year's Humanities Forum events here at the Gleacher Center. Uh, the Humanities Forum is brought to you by the Frankie Institute for the Humanities and the Division of the Humanities at the University of Chicago. And it's designed to showcase um, the work of our faculty for a wider public. There will be a, uh, a wine reception uh, at the end of the um, uh, lecture and the Q&A. You're all invited to that. Um, I also want to acknowledge, uh, as I seldom do, too seldom do, uh, Maya Vuksovic, who is uh, responsible for uh, much of the work uh, that goes into the production of the Humanities Forum every quarter. Um, thank you, Maya, for all that you do. Um, also want to announce the, the next event, which will take place on Wednesday, May 4th, in this very room. Uh, we'll have Christine Mehring, who is the uh, chair of the Art History Department at the University and a specialist in uh, contemporary art. She's involved in a major project now um, uh, that has to do uh, with the, uh, the fluxus movement of the 1980s in um, process art and um, the, the, the uh, a production of 1982 in which a 1957 Cadillac was covered in concrete as a, as a kind of performance art, uh, raising the question of you know, what happens to the object afterward? How is it curated? Where is it storage, uh, stored and so on? And it just, it just hung around for ages and ages. Um, nobody knew what to do with it. Um, Christine went to President Zimmer and President Zimmer said, no, we're not going to spend a penny on this. We're just <laughs> And she stayed after it and stayed after it, and uh, now it's been restored, and that itself is a story. Um, and the Museum of Contemporary Art is involved in this, and there's going to be a kind of procession this spring that leads the new renovated, concrete-covered 1957 Cadillac from the Museum of Contemporary Art down to what will be its permanent place of storage in our parking garage at 57th and Ellis. There's a little... There's a little mock-up of a concrete car already in one of the stalls there. They're going to have video events and conferences about Fluxus and films about Fluxus. So um, Christine uh, is going to be here to t talk on the subject, Material Matters in Post-War Art, really about the question of how uh, what art is made of uh, has come to be such an important question in, um, the, since the late 20th century. Um, but this wonderful crowd is assembled here today for other purposes. Um, and to introduce the speaker you have come to hear, I give you my dear colleague, David Bevington, the Phyllis Fay Horton Professor Emeritus in the Departments of English and Comparative Literature. David, will you do the honors? Yay. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for being here. Well, Nick Ruddle uh, grew up in the 1940s and 50s in Wales, where his talent for acting was quickly recognized. In school, he took roles like that of Goneril in King Lear, and then when his voice changed, went on to other parts. He <laughs> continued his study in drama at, uh, at Cambridge University, where he also uh, pursued the ancient classics, especially Greek, and then studied classical uh, studies at Cornell University, where after he came in the late 60s to the University of Chicago with a joint position in classics and uh, in theater. He worked with students in university theater and with court theater in a new, lo new theater space that he created of what had been the, uh, the South Lounge in the, uh, the Hutch Commons. There he directed a series of really brilliant productions. Soon with the help of the university he planned and raised money for the new theater building that is now court theater. There, beginning in the early 70s, he directed and acted brilliantly at, at a number of shows until 19, his retirement there from 1994. He continues to publish an impressive series of theatrically oriented translations of many plays, including Sophocles, Antigone, and Oedipus the King, and Electra, Euripides' Medea, The Trojan Women, Ibsen's A Doll House, Hedda Gabler, Ghost's Master Builder. Right at present, Court Theater is in the process of producing three uh, Greek tragedies and new translations commissioned by, uh, to be by Nick. Uh, last year at the 2014-15 season, we saw Euripides at Iphigenia and Aulis, 
then this current season, Agamemnon by Aeschylus, and coming up in the next season, Sophocles Electra. Nick has gained a, a huge international and national reputation. He's acted and directed and published uh, just about everywhere. This fall, we'll see the 21st published translation by him. This is of the Aeschylus uh, Agamemnon that was fe featured at, at Court Theatre. Recent production in productions include, that he's been directing, include the Trojan Women on the main stage at Stratford, Canada, the Bacchae in Central Park in New York with original music, if you, if you believe, by uh, Philip Glass, who's here currently at the university, and Sophocles is the three, uh, the Theban, play, uh, the Theban plays, Oedipus, uh, Antigone, and Oedipus Columbus. This, uh, perhaps of the most uh, classiest occasion, as the opening theatrical event uh, of the of the of the <coughs> uh, Olympic Games in uh, on the Acropolis in Athens, <laughs> you can imagine the having a show of the Greek plays there uh, in uh, directed by Nick and so on. It's it's wonderful. Uh, I want to add to this uh, my own a personal tribute in terms of my own career in teaching the history of uh, Western drama. I joined the uh, board at Court Theater from the very beginning and remained on it until this last year. I've seen all of Nick's productions uh, many times and have acted as, uh, as dramaturg on some occasions. I was, um, he and I then created a course about 15 years ago in the history and theory of drama, which is still running from the ancient Greeks down to Tom Stoppard and Carol Churchill and Tony Kushner. Uh, and this course owns its inspiration and its contents to Nick's pioneering work of the classic schedule, the repertory that he created for us at Court Theatre. This has been my own personal education in the history of Western drama, and it is a profound debt that I can never repay. That is why I am so honored to be able to present to you this evening, Nick Ruddle. David, could I have my script? <laughs> <laughs> So the title is what we call Greek Tragedy, and we owe that title to Jim, actually, because when he asked me to do this talk four months ago, I said, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. So we came up with this title. <laughs> but in fact, it turned on something which began to fascinate me about a year ago, and it's this. We call it Greek Tragedy, but in fact, it is not. Of course it is, it's in Greek. <laughs> but of the 30 surviving plays that we have, the tragedies that we have, they were all written, performed, and sponsored in initially the small town of Athens. And subsequently, in the last 60 years of the fifth century, they were the magnificent centerpiece of a major festival and became huge and very important to the culture of that town which had grown from a parochial small wooden walled city into the center of a intellectual and architectural <laughs> empire. So <coughs> that observation is in a sense, obvious, but we never l think about it, and therefore I think we lose a couple of very important things. The first is why, and an extraordinarily difficult question, why are these tragedies the ones that touch us so much and then there's nothing for 2,000 years? There's nothing till Shakespeare that we can properly call tragedies. What, what were the ingredients that made these so powerful and allowed these 30 plays to survive. Northrop Fry has a suggestion, which we'll touch on. He's, he says it's absolutely necessary to have the vision, the boldness of an empire. That is, those who are creating within that brief period of time need grandeur as their background. And in a sense, that's par obviously partially true, uh, just simply from the, the facts of the two empires. But there are many other things, too. 
And one of the points I want to try to make is that the very parochialism of the beginning of this form, later transformed by the imperialism of Athens, creates a very peculiar kind of fusion of the two so that we are able to confront huge, huge problems, huge questions, and yet see them through the small parochial eyes of a small family. And we see them so particularly that way. I was thinking the other day when I was thinking about this, it's sort of as though the kitchen sink drama of Britain after World War II remained kitchen sink because it didn't have an empire. It only had the kitchen sink. <laughs> but Athens had both in some sense. So I will, I have to be brief. So I will condense. One of the questions is, why do we call it Greek tragedy and not call it Athenian tragedy? And that's, in a, in a strange sense, fairly important. The first answer is because of Aristotle, who was a... He had become a Macedonian when he was writing the poetics and when he was <coughs> writing other handbooks on how to be an educated citizen. And it's very, very strange that in the poetics, he never mentions that this is Athenian. He never mentions that it's the polis. He genericizes, and he allows the English department to thrive. <laughs> <I th> <laughs> <laughs> that is, you've all been having reconsiderations of the past history of the department. And, and th that formulaic notion of how to look at literature has been incredibly important. But it did have this one effect, which is it genericized. And so one of the things I want to do is to talk about the details of that. The second thing that's strangely important is that when Greek literature surfaced in the late Renaissance, it surfaced earlier, but it it was <coughs> absorbed by the Italian humanists. And the degree of lack of knowledge is occasionally extraordinarily wonderfully funny. That is, for example, the orchestra, which you all know is the dance center of the theater. No one knows what it's for anymore. And in fact, you don't too, because you sit in the orchestra seats when you go, you sit in the front. But the notion of what the theaters were like physically were just simply not known. There's a wonderful drawing of the Swan Theatre in London, which has on the side in one of the balconies the word orchestra, just sitting there not knowing what it was. But more importantly, <coughs> what you had was that, <coughs> excuse me, that these Italian humanists tried to recreate what a Greek tragedy was like. And indeed, that's why we have opera, as you, many of you must know. That is that the long speeches in tragedy were translated into sung arias. The term chorus, which meant dance, became the chorus of modern opera. And the recitatives were just those little bits of dialogue that were in Greek tragedy. So there's been this attempt to generalize what was Greek tragedy for a very long time, in a sense. Green and Latimore are to blame, too. They call them the complete Greek tragedies, too. And it's fine. There's nothing wrong in calling them Greek tragedies. But if we do not look at the very specific, oh, I, I'm tempted to use the per early parochial no, no, nation, notion excuse me, <coughs> of, of what was happening in Athens, we, we miss a lot of nuance. So OK. First of all, it's important to have for all of us here a, a quick overview in terms of history. So, because it's so difficult for all of us to count backwards. And that 1200 BC is the time of the Trojan War, but 400 years later, it's the invention of writing. And for 400 years, you've had <coughs> the Iliad and the Odyssey sung as a part history and part entertainment, but most importantly for us, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the other epics, the Nostoi, were the fodder, as Aristotle himself says, the fodder for tragedy. That is, he, Aristotle mentions quite frequently, isn't it strange, he says, that we only write about a few families. 
And indeed, they kept on writing about Iphigenia and Agamemnon and Electra time and time and time again, using that family story to examine much more complicated and increasingly political ideas. And this is where my point will go, I hope. So, <coughs> oh, there's one other important point in terms of the history. It is that <coughs> the Iliad in one sense did something else that was very important. It pointed out the possibility of a unified Greece, Pan-Hellenism. And that stayed in the consciousness. But what was happening on the contrary from the Trojan War down to 700 BC was that the Mediterranean was being colonized from the east, which is the coastline of Turkey, all the way to South Italy. And it was being colonized. Its dialects were becoming fragmented. And most importantly, it had independent states which had a variety of different forms of government. They had inherited kingdoms, basilis, they had tyrannies, they had oligarchies, they had nobility. One thing they didn't have is democracy of, in any form. And so the next important point for us in terms of history is the second conflict with the East, which is the Persian Wars, which started, of course, around 500 BC, where uh, the invasion of Greek lands uh, resulted in Persia being rejected on land, and it also provided work for Brad Pitt. Because <coughs> Hollywood keeps on doing that section of history time and time again. And then for 20 years, Persia decided that what it would do is to build a fleet. But more importantly, Athens decided to build a fleet. And over those 20 years, from 500 to 80, Athens built over 240 ships. They were able to do it because they discovered a silver mine and they built this fleet and they defeated the Persians at Salamis in around 480. This is huge for what I'm talking about now because what had been going on before in terms of festivals and drama was just in a small wooden town. But now it became an empire, and I'd like to see if we can touch on that transition. Let me just um, talk briefly, if I may, about what we think the origins were and how, what it was like in the undocumented 6th century. I mean, the name that you all know is Thespian, of course, and there was a shadowy figure called Thespis, who clearly was an actor in the theater at Athens, but what was that theater? Probably where it is now and where it was then, which was on the Acropolis, because they needed a flat space for dancing and a place for people to sit on the corner of the mountain, but it was wooden. But what happened after that was this. There were two festivals, one in late January and one in early March, like now. Strange time to do outdoor theater. But they were festivals dedicated to Dionysus. It was the opening of the wine. And they became two huge festivals. The second one in March was called the Dionysia, just a celebration of Dionysus. The earlier one called the Lenaia was less particular, but still about Dionysus. Very quickly, that became very important to the very nature of what theater became in the following sense. Dionysus was, of course, the god of wine, but he was also a god of fertility. And one of the aspects of the primitive festivals in the sixth century at the beginning was indeed the carrying around of the phallus. There's a wonderful passage in Aristophanes' first play recounting what that festival would have been like. The little servant girl would be carrying fruit in a basket and the young kids would be carrying phalluses behind her. And he's saying, don't do that, don't touch her. And his wife is watching from the roof. But now, after Salamis, Athens became a power because it demanded tribute and became incredibly rich, incredibly quickly. And 
It was a benign empire. This is very important. It didn't invade anywhere. It just was the mafia of the Mediterranean. It provided protection money. And it had enormous wealth incredibly quickly. And what did it do? It built things, first of all. Of course, the Parthenon, it started using marble instead of wood. <coughs> did the Parthenon, the Pnyx, which is the place where they kept the money, and they built the Areopagus, which was the law courts, all on the Acropolis and the Odeon, where my plays were done. And somehow it was there for the center of the city, but this festival, the Dionysia, became incredibly important politically. Because what they did was they turned this small local festival into an international festival. They invited the people who had given the money to sit, to sit with Socrates, to sit with the politician Cleon, to sit with Pericles, to sit in this theater. And the theater was now enormous by our standards. And we ha this is the first thing we have to do to disabuse ourselves of what we think of as generic theater. It could seat 20,000 people. That's Plato's estimate. 20,000 people. Now, why would you do that? Well, you would do it because you only put the plays on once. It was an enormous event. You wanted all the citizens there to come and see what became hugely important politically and artistically because the other part of the empire was the cultivation of Herodotus, Thucydides, the beginning of history, the cultivation of a new form, rhetoric, that is the ability to argue in public, not done before, and indeed tragedy and indeed comedy, all in this bizarrely short space of human time. So, <coughs> what I... All right, I've got to do this quickly. What I, <coughs> what I wanted to do is to say this overall thing, first of all, namely that the internationalizing, the politicizing, and I use the word advisedly, it's the, the use of the polis to write about serious things, was unique to Athens. Right? It was a chance to discuss things of enormous importance. It was also a chance in the play to just occasionally say, aren't we great? And they said it very often. In fact, my favorite one is in the Medea, where Medea can do anything. And she's just decided she's going to kill the kids and then she's going to fly off in her chariot. But fortunately, the king of Athens comes by, Aegis, and she said, could I go there? He says, sure. And she's perfect now. She's got a place to go, Athens. All the time you find these little references in the plays to salvation being in this democratic state. And one of the things I want to suggest is that Athens saw itself as democratic. And at the height of its power, between 480 and the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, some 30 years later, well, 40 years later, it, <coughs> it proselytized its own intelligence and its own history and its own artistry to an extraordinary extent. But the period that we're talking about, from 460 BC down to 405 when Athens died, happens to cover glory and death, the beginning of the empire and the death of the empire and always telling the stories through individual members of family. So let me quickly talk about the Oresteia and how looking, it's possible to look at it afresh. At the beginning of the Agamemnon, you have a myth that we all know, the murder of Agamemnon. But there is a chorus that we never look at particularly. We don't question who they are. But in fact, they are an anachronism. They are 12 citizens. Could only happen in the theater of Athens. They are there to say, we can resist this. They have individual voices even, which you never get anywhere else. There's a section of 12 individual voices. However, they fail in the first part. 
But these 12 people, in the end, become the 12 jury members that judge Orestes in the Areopagus, which had just been built, which was just behind the theater. And so this audience is watching itself, watching its own recent immediate history. And that's the, probably the most important part of what I'm saying. It gradually became possible to touch on the immediate, the things that were just happening, the critical, awful, terrible things, and the glorious things. So the Oristia is glorious, beginning of the empire. Uh, but Iphigenia and Aulis is the end, the death. But we see it through the death of a small child. That's what I'm talking about. It's about a family. So we can weep at her when, in fact, we are talking about the futility of death in a ridiculous war. And it's that fusion of the parochial with the large that is so peculiarly Athenian. Very quickly, when you look at some of the plays that when we ignore this question, like Oedipus, and start thinking about what the audience was when they were watching this play in the early part of, say, 428. Things begin to resonate. Oedipus has caused a plague. He is an intelligent, benign ruler in many ways. But he's a single ruler. He is a tyrant. It was very convenient for the Athenian playwrights that Thebes had more myths than anyone else because they were all tyrants, and they could always compare themselves to these creatures. And it's, if you think, Pericles had just caused a plague in Athens by making sure that the citizens were within the walls. Now, that's not to say that Sophocles was saying this is Pericles. The opposite. It's just the reverberations are peculiarly Athenian. In fact, it was David who first, when we were teaching together, started talking about this. One of the central points of Thucydides in looking at why Athens was prone to fall was a word that he partially coined called polypragmosyne, which means you can't keep your goddamn hands off anything. You're Athenian. You've got to do it. And if there is any tragedy for us in human behavior, in Oedipus the King, it is that he can't stop. And so it's a very Athenian play. And very briefly, one other. The last play, which David Green wrote beautifully about, the last play of Sophocles, Oedipus at Colonus. Sophocles decides that, in fact, probably he's given Oedipus too much pain <laughs> in all the plays he's written about him. I mean, that's David's day. And what he does instead is give him a kind of apotheosis at Colonus. What we always forget is Colonus was Bridgeport. <laughs> Just a tiny little suburb of Athens. And that's where Oedipus is going to finally have his rest. Very briefly with, elect with um, Euripides, two things. One is very early on, in a play called The Alcestis, uh, a man is condemned to death, and what he does is he tries to argue for members of his family to die in his stead. And in one extraordinary interchange with his father, he asks his father to die in his stead. And the argument revolves around which was a, that which was a current philosophical argument, which is what is natural law, phusis, and what is human law created by human beings, nomos. And the father at one point said, tell me where it's natural for a, die, for a father to die for his son. I mean, it's not, it's neither natural, nor will you find it entrenched in human, in nomos. Why is that important? Well, if you look at the clouds, it's what Socrates is arguing about. It's about a new, onslaught to traditional Athenian values. That is, it is time to replace the old with the young. Terrified. I mean, it's as bad as sort of kicking 40-year-old men out of a coffee shop in contemporary Athens. They were all sitting around. They just simply hated the idea that the sons could have a say. 
And this play started to talk about that in huge philosophical terms. Aristophanes in the clouds writes a whole play about it, and Plato in the early dialogues indeed tackles the subject of loyalty to father, as did Xenophon in his pieces about Socrates. One last one for Euripides. The great play, The Trojan Women, is in fact the most terrifyingly immediate indictment of the Athenian people. Because two years before the play, Athens had invaded the island of Milos, which was a place that was meant to keep on giving money to Athens as part of the empire. They refused to give, and Athens, this is the long de Melian debate in Thucydides, Athens did this. It killed all the men, and it murdered most of the young boys. And it sold the women into slavery after rape. It was Serbanita. But this is Athens. And <laughs> this is Athens, and Athens has to confront that. And what Euripides does again is to tell a terrifying story, vaguely taken from myth. I mean, Hecuba and Andromache don't, there's no other source except Euripides writing for this. But he's, he can tell this devastating political indictment through the stories from the Trojan War. And yet at the beginning of the play he does this. The chorus of women who know they're going to be slaves are singing about how terrible it's going to be, but in one verse one of them says, I hope I'm going to be a slave in Athens. <laughs> <laughs> and <coughs> at first that used to nauseate me, but I really think that Euripides' extraordinary level of irony is what's happening. So those kind of, I'm, I, you know, I've touched on four plays. It permeates these plays. And I will end, I must end. <laughs> I will end by talking about two things. One is the Aristophanes and the Frogs, the play he wrote when Athens was dying. He decides that he has to choose, that in fact Dionysus the god has to choose, between the three playwrights who are now dead. And at first Dionysus chooses Euripides, they have a competition, etc., etc. And at the end of the play, Dionysus chooses Aeschylus because, he said, he fought at Marathon and not Euripides because he spends too much time with Socrates. And what he says, in fact, is that we need these playwrights to come back and save our city. This is extraordinary. What we finally have to recognize is that over those 60 years, the playwrights were the philosophers, the political thinkers, and they were revered as the major spokespersons of what it meant to be Athenian, and indeed, how difficult it was to be human. I should end with that sentence, because it was okay. <laughs> <coughs> but two days ago, I looked at, two days ago, I looked at uh, the most recent copy of Classical Philology, and there was a review of a book that just came out from a woman in, at Cambridge, and she was writing about 100 years later, a time of Lycurgus, when the orators themselves were trying very hard to restore democracy in the face of the Macedonian threat, which was about to happen. The Macedonian threat where, indeed, Aristotle was writing his generic stuff, not mentioning the polis at all. But Lycurgus, it seems, noticed that everyone was forgetting that tragedy was, was, was Athenian. And even a hundred years later, he was aware that this was dying. So what did he do? In the entrance for the chorus to come in, in the Paradise, he built three huge statues, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, in an attempt to make it Athenian again. Good, thank you. <laughs>